President Ursula von der Leyen has offered a health, heartfelt apology to Italy for not helping at the start of its deadly coronavirus outbreak. Many Italians have criticised the EU's response to the pandemic and say the bloc didn't do enough to help at the beginning. The country, which was the first to lock down in Europe, began lifting some lockdown measures on Tuesday after it had seen a recent decline in the total new daily cases. Well, Carly Drink- Drinkwater is a languages teacher, former BBC journalist who's been living in the hard hit north of Italy since the lockdown began. And that's in, you're in Lombardy or Lombardy. I can never remember how to pronounce this, Carly. Oh, um, yeah, just bear with me, Carly. I'm going to get get there in the end. Don't worry about it. It's entirely my fault. Yeah, Carly, I got you now. Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, apologies, apologies. Now, I was going to say, is it Lombardy, the region that you're in? No, I actually live in Emilia-Romagna, but it is next to Lombardy. Uh, so Lombardy is the English way of pronouncing it. Yeah. Um, and they were the first hit within Italy. They were what was a red zone before the entire country went into to lockdown. Emilia-Romagna is actually the second highest hit out of the country after Lombardy, which is no surprise, really, because we're, because we're adjoining it. Um, but we are now starting week seven of total lockdown here in Italy, and it's uh, it's getting really tough. I've got to be honest to not even be allowed outside for a walk. It's very different in the UK. And when the EU is apologising for its lack of help at the beginning, what help did it not give at the beginning that it should have? I think really it was a lot of financial aid. Um, the, the country, the, Italy, is really struggling economically. Um, and we were left really to to fight through this until it got to to breaking point until the healthcare system was collapsing. Uh, so they have offered aid later on, later on in the in the whole process, and as it exploded into a full on pandemic. Uh, but we were left floundering a little bit at the beginning, and um, we we felt neglected really by the EU as a whole. So there is help now, but the damage is done. Uh, we are in a very serious situation. We are now at almost 179,000 cases since this began and 23,660 people have died since this has started. So now it's a, it's a case of trying to not even contain this anymore. It's just managing the wave uh, of cases that we have and try to build some kind of plan to get out of this. But it's not going to be for a long time. It looks like we're going to be in this for some predictions, say, a year before we're back to normality. Are, are people there not blaming the government, though? When, when they turn on the EU, surely it's, it's mm. up to the government to, to, to be asking the EU for the help that it needed at the beginning and demanding it as well. Yeah, you're right on that one. There, there has been quite a lot of faith and trust uh, in the Prime Minister, Giuseppe Conti, he has probably risen in ratings. There's been a lot of support for him. But you're right there. There, there should have been more done. Um, I think there is some disquiet with the government's uh, support for people like the self-employed. They have really, really suffered in this. And Italy is a nation of small businesses. So if you're self-employed, you went to zero euros overnight when the national decree was announced um, seven weeks ago and that that's left a lot of people with nothing and then 600 euros was offered 600 euros is the stipend offered for for those who work for themselves which of course if you've been on a full salary suddenly to go to that you're not even covering your your basic bills people are extremely impacted and they will be for a long time some businesses will never recover Seven weeks of a lockdown. We're halfway through that at the moment. We're expecting at least another three weeks. How how have you coped? Do you mind talking me through it? When was the what's been the toughest period? To be honest, it's about now because you go up and down through all the emotions. You you accept it. You start to process it. You think, well, there are other people a lot worse off than you. And that is still true. I still think of the doctors and nurses putting their lives on the line uh, for people who are fighting this in hospital. But it's at this point now where the shock has long dissipated since. uh, And now we're in this strange new normal of a very small amount uh, of space, 
We are in an apartment, which is very typical for Italy. A lot of people don't have a garden. They just have a balcony. And it's almost like we just have to accept that this is what life is for the foreseeable, not even being able to go out for a walk or a run. There's no allowance for our personal health and our mental health. So at, at the moment, I'm finding this the toughest. I've kind of gone on the roller coaster of emotions and you have your, your up moments where you think, OK, we can do this. We can be motivated. We can push through. You have your down still times. But it's, it's this period of waiting when we see the cases dropping and we see the number of deaths dropping. We think, finally, it's working. Everything we're doing is working. So can we please just be let outside for a little walk? And that isn't coming. At the moment, we've been told May the 3rd is the next hurdle. And from there, we hope for, for some news of easing of restrictions because at the moment, it, it's just not happening. Nothing is happening. It's so quiet. We're all fighting so quietly. But we're hearing that there has been some lifting of the lockdown measures, though, some easing of it. Have you not noticed any of that? They did open a few businesses last week after Easter. So a, a smattering of businesses were allowed to reopen, such as bookshops, uh, children's clothing stores, because, of course, children are growing all this time and they'll need new clothes, new shoes. We're not really affected by that here because we don't live in a city. We live really in the countryside in a very small district. And because the decree of the lockdown means you cannot move between districts or municipalities, it, we're, we're not seeing any effects. You know, we don't need to go to a book shop or, or buy a new pair of shoes um, for a child. So we are in exactly the same situation because it's not a case of some businesses have reopened, so, oh, let's all start moving around. The paperwork and the bureaucracy is extremely tight um, and strict. We have to have paperwork even to go to the supermarket and you have to fill it out with all your personal details, your address, your identity number, and you have to specify the supermarket you're going to so that when police complete their checks and they see where you live and where you're going, they can see if you're on the right route or not. And if you're not, there are fines for breaking the decree up to thousands of euros. So we can't take it as an excuse to go out to some businesses that have opened because police check all the time they drive around with megaphones reminding us to stay inside it's only essential needs that will permit you to leave the house and, and these are not essential for us to do anything but buy groceries still police literally are driving around with megaphones saying stay indoors stay indoors stay indoors Yes, they do really uh, frequently. Usually in the mornings, uh, a police car will drive around with a megaphone and it will say that due to the emergency coronavirus, you must stay indoors as much as possible, save for essential needs. Uh, and that's done repetitively. There are also drones um, flying around now and again. Uh, I saw a helicopter the other day. and So it's been documented that they are doing aerial checks just to see how many people are moving around or, or on a walk if they shouldn't be. Because, of course, the only reason anyone should be outside at this point is for going to the supermarket or an, an essential need. Yeah. How much of this can you take? If, if you, know, you pass that May the 3rd hurdle, which is still a couple of weeks away, and, you, and the government says, look, we've got, we've got to extend it a little bit longer, how, how much more can people take that? It's a really good question. I don't know the answer because I don't know how I will do it personally. I said that this week, how much more can we do of this before we completely lose the plot? Because, you know, it's a, a huge strain on, on your mental um, health and how much of a challenge it is just to keep going like this. One thing that's become really clear is that we, we need each other. We need social contact as humans um, to be healthy. It's not just the fact that we have been financially impacted and it will take a long time to come back from this. It's not just a physical need to, to go out and walk and have fresh air. It's, it's really tough to, to keep on going. And the hope is the only driving force. So like you say, it's another two weeks, which is a lot to contemplate at this point. But it's enough hope to keep us going. And we're thinking, oh, 
just please let us let us go outside after May the third. Surely that's what they're going to say. They're going to ease restrictions. Um, but the problem is they want to give us some hope, but not too much because when people do think we're nearly through it, we're nearly out of the woods, people start breaking the decree. And in fact, we had a record amount of fines last week for people starting to to go outside. They thought, well, we're on the right track. The cases are declining, deaths are declining. We're doing the right thing. It's working. Um, But of course, this is the point when we've been told by the authorities, we must keep going we've got to keep our guard up because if we don't we'll reverse all the progress we've made to this point and the virus will explode again Uh, and all of this will have been for nothing so we must continue in this way how has the health service coped there because the numbers of deaths have been you know far greater than in any european country including spain which has had a really bad rough time as well and as you said, Italy was struggling financially, economically at least, even before the virus hit. How has the health service coped? Well, they're not. Uh, it, it is really struggling. Um, doctors and nurses are, are dying in the fight. Um, intensive care units have been full for weeks now. Uh, there are people being saved in the corridors of hospitals. It, it's more than, than they can deal with. If people have symptoms, but they're not critical, then in the first instance, they should be staying at home and we're given a number to call. But if they are critical, then the the healthcare system is doing its best, but it's not enough. It's not enough, uh, which is evident with how many people are dying from this. It it does have to be said as well that Italy has an aging population um, and a lot of the deaths are old people, the average age of people dying from this it fluctuates but it's around the 80 years mark even though there are people young dying from this as well um but it, of course that is a huge strain which they are they're doing their best with but it's like fighting a an incoming tide it's almost impossible for the doctors and nurses to keep coping with <sighs> Thank you. Gosh, it does sound like you've got something of a huge challenge over there, Carly. I'm not going to tell you what what the scene was like in Regent's Park this afternoon on a sunny day in London, uh, but you know that our our, um, lockdown restrictions aren't quite as stringent as they are in Italy. And certainly the police aren't going around with megaphones telling you to stay indoors or anything like that, or handing out the the, the number of fines that uh, you're telling us about in Italy. Italy. What do you think about when you re- reflect on the difference? Are, are we doing the right thing, or is I find something? it amazing? Actually, I think everybody, every country has its own goals and its own strategies. Um, but it, it does confuse me um, a little bit how other countries can be much more relaxed. I know social distancing is in place, and um, in the UK, you're supposed to have one hour of exercise a day locally. Um, but I think giving a little bit of freedom can, can can spread the virus. I mean, I wish we could go outside. Uh, I wish there was a way for us to, to live with it already a little bit more easily and healthily. Um, but I think that the numbers of uh, UK cases are accelerating faster than, than ours where you're, you're catching up a lot faster. Um, and at some point, you may supersede us. Uh, Spain have superseded us. France is rapidly catching up and they had much more lax lockdown measures um, than we have. I, I, I really would like to know the answer. I would like to know how the different um, health ministries of different countries have decided on this perhaps with Italy because we were the first hit and it was so hard hit they had to put these measures in place that were so so strict uh, because we were already far behind but the UK saw this from not so far away uh, and I felt that the government really took their time you know they dragged their heels with imposing restrictions and and a lockdown so we will just have to see how it works i really really hope that the uk doesn't get as bad as here without this amount of sacrifice but to be able to still go out and be in close contact with each other with such a dangerous and contagious virus really does baffle me uh, to be honest yeah carly thank you very much
You're you're so welcome. Please keep safe. <laughs> yeah, and keep safe yourself as well. And hopefully we'll speak to you again. Carly, drink water there, who is in Italy, in the north of Italy, in the, I suppose, most profound region in terms of coronavirus in Italy. She's a languages teacher, former BBC journalist as well. And you hear the difference there with what's happening there in their seventh week of lockdown compared to what's happening over here. They've had 23,660 deaths there, by the way. And she said that um, they've been superseded by Spain, which has now got more cases of coronavirus, 195,000, uh, almost 196,000, actually, uh, compared to 178,000. But the deaths in Spain are less, about 3,000 less than in Italy. Lots to talk about. Yeah, you can respond to anything that you heard Carly say there about the difference between the way they're dealing with this in Italy, where she is, and the way that we're dealing with it in the UK, and particularly the way that we're dealing with it in London as well. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, feel free to join us. It'll be great to speak to you on any of these issues over the next uh, hour or so of me being here. At seven o'clock, it'll be time. 